The last words my father said before I left for Stratton Air Force Base were, son, I don't think you'll survive alone in Greenland for three weeks. <laughs> 10 bucks says you get medevac out. <laughs> well, three weeks later, as I lied frozen and perplexed in the cargo hold of an LC-130, much like this one, I realized that I owed my old man an Alexander Hamilton. <laughs> Queasy from altitude sickness, I looked out the small pinhole of a window and I saw the light. You know, since it's 24-hour sunlight in the Greenlandic summer. <laughs> Summit camp, my home away from home, and the zenith of the Greenlandic ice sheet disappeared below me, engulfed by the vast Arctic expanse. I could see the world with its moulins and glaciers and rivers whiz by, the cold world, the amazing world, the real world. For me, and millions of students like me, school has made the real world sound almost mythical. After every failed test, every tardy acquired, every period skipped, we are constantly reminded that the real world is waiting for us. Apparently, it is a land of taxes and lost dreams. <laughs> of cutthroat competition and constant categorization. Real world of preparedness seems to be the end all, be all of education nowadays. So students leave high school and immediately become coherent, fully functioning members of society. <laughs> From a student's point of view, this current rigid model of education does not properly prepare us for the real, real world because it fixates around the wrong question. The question shouldn't be, are students prepared for the real world, but rather, is the real world prepared for students? Kids, oh, thank you. Thank you. Kids, kids are bursting with an innate curiosity, ready to impact the world around them if given the opportunities to do so. But as kids become teens and as teens become adults, and dare I say, as adults become old and senile, <laughs> this innate curiosity wanes in favor of mundane realism. So I believe that the purpose of a real-world-ready education is to foster this innate curiosity. My innate curiosity has always been science. From a young age, I knew that I wanted to do science, and it's something that's inter uh, interested me um, since I've grown up. And, walking, and as a freshman, I was advised into taking advanced placement science courses at my high school, which is a huge proponent of STEM education. Walking into AP Biology class freshman year, I was handed a thick stack of textbooks and told, learn. Oddly enough, the amount of time I spent reading that textbook was inversely proportional to my understanding of biology. In fact, I was often so bored and confused with the material presented that I put my head down in the book in hopes that the information would just magically seep into my brain as if through osmosis. What, the missing link in all of this was enjoyment. Where was that sense of discovery, of not only in science, but in the pursuit of learning itself, that ownership of learning? And an alternative to the current standard model of education is field school learning. Field school learning involves going out into the community, into the field, and observing science as it takes place. And I think this is a critical form of real-world ready education because it takes scientific theory, which is presented in textbooks, but applies that to real-world settings and problems. The world, while rooted in theory, runs off problems. This summer, I had the opportunity of participating in the Joint Science Education Project, a collaboration among the United States, Denmark, and Greenland to experience field school learning for three weeks in the Greenlandic summer. Upon my Greenlandic adventure started off in the coastal settlement of Kangaroo Swash, which you can see here. And upon my arrival, I was not handed a burly textbook, but rather a small pocket notebook. And this simple shift in literature completely changed my learning experience. Suddenly, the expectation went from memorizing science to recording and interpreting science through my senses. Memorization and interpretation are two very different 
yet two very relevant skills in the 21st century, but I think the argument can be made that interpretation is far more valuable because if students can interpret different given contexts, they can find their niche, they can find what role they would best fit in to solve any problem. So what does field school learning look like? This is one of the many problems that we had in Kangaroo Swack. The water from the river comes from glaciers several kilometers in the other direction, and as a result, the water flow rate is rarely constant. It fluctuates with the season and the different melting patterns of the ice. And we wanted to find the volume of water passing under that bridge per second. And that involved taking different calculations, such as the cross-sectional area of the river and the velocity of the water at a certain point. Evidently, that was easier said than done. The teachers and the adults in, of this project took on more of an advisory or mentorship role. And, they, and that gave us, as students, the space and the freedom to fail and to try trial and error. And fail we did on this. Uh, we, we failed quite a bit, actually. Um, note how in field school learning, failure is encouraged. It's welcomed. And unlike in schools where, where failure is seen as inherently negative because it reflects poorly on our metrics of achievement, particularly test scores, failure is what really drives our innate curiosities. And so I think that should be fostered. This shot comes from uh, the snow pit at Summit Camp. And we dug, dug, dug this for hours. And due to the high altitude, um, which Summit Camp is theoretically the highest point of Greenland, we, it was the, uh, there were low oxygen concentrations. So that made this task even more arduous. So why did we dig for so long? Ice. As snow melt, as, as snow falls over summit camp, it doesn't melt. And this accumulation leads to the stratification of ancient ice. And while we learn about ice in almost every basic biology class, without its function, life would cease to exist, we found out that if you look at the oxygen isotope concentrations in the ice, you can see temperature fluctuations through time. So if we had a cross section of the ice, we would literally have a climatic timeline going back hundreds of years. And that's why we, we were curious and we really wanted to look at that ice pattern. And this was the result. If you shine backlight onto the ice, you can distinctly see the different, uh, the different bands and the different colorations of um, the different episodes of climatic history. So in one year, there might have been a huge melting or another year there might have been a huge freezing. And so you can clearly see that in the ice. And that was very interesting to see for us as students. Through our work, we actually had a discovery that had an impact on us. It was something we worked for. But I think the biggest allure of field school learning addresses what a typical textbook education painfully neglects, communication. Knowledge is in the articulation of the beholder. Because if students can't convey what they learned to others, what is the purpose of learning it to begin with? We always talked at the end of field school day, every day, we talked with different leaders of science going on in the Greenlandic area. We talked to each other. We talked to everyone that had an interest in science. And we found there was many interdisciplinary, interdisciplinary connections, different ways of thinking, and especially being in different cultures. There was Greenlandic people, there was Americans, and there was Danish students. We found they had different ways of looking at things, and that really changed how we viewed science. We viewed it as a interdisciplinary context. And that, that completely blew my mind as to what science really was. And as a result, I learned more about science in three weeks in Greenland than I ever did in three years of taking AP science courses. And that revelation really struck a chord with me because maybe we're going about things in the wrong way. So how can all students somehow get this sort of education? That is really the question I think we need to have to ask as educators. As education stakeholders, you all have the crucial role of educating the future of America and with increasing budget cuts and less freedom in certain curricular frameworks, 
it is even more difficult than ever to reach out to our most vulnerable students in the most profound way. So does that mean that all students have to go to Greenland to achieve a real-world education? Absolutely not. And I hope not as well, because I, I feel that a real-world-ready education should be a right made accessible to all students, regardless of opportunity presented. So your biggest tool is your own backyard. It's the community right outside, just outside your doorstep. For many students, you will be the only gateway they'll ever have to the outside world, to a truly organic education. Real world, the real world is more than just the sum of its facts. It is a whole community, an intricate community of learners, of processes, of things going on in the world around them that need students, your students, to drive it forward. And it only, the first step is putting your, your foot out into uncharted territory. And through my experiences, making that simple shift into finding where you belong in the universe through your senses and field school learning gave me some of the best friends that I've ever made. And I've seen some of the coolest things that I'll ever see. But those things are in everyone's backyards. And we don't even know what's out in our own backyards. And that's crazy. And so thank you. And this talk would not be possible without a selfie from Greenland.